talked about uh, you got it. Got it. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, we talked about um, life in the universe and I'm decided to break it down into a few sections uh, and kind of introduce, I think it's really important to have a good background on life um, because I suspect that we will be getting a lot of uh, new information as James Webb and other things come come online. Uh, so we want to know what what whatever they're finding, what does that mean for life? But first we'll talk about uh, some other space stuff. Uh, update on James Webb. Um, the instruments are cooling down. Uh, if you remember the fine guidance system, that was Canada's contribution uh, two weeks ago was at minus 224 and now it's at minus 235. And they're now doing a uh, segment identification and, and alignment. But first James Webb took a selfie. There we go. I'm not exactly sure where the camera was, but we can see the tripod that holds the secondary mirror. Uh, obviously, it, I, I don't know, it might have even had a flash on it and really illuminated this one uh, segment. Um, so it did take its first picture and believe it or not, this is a single star. But of course, because the, the mirrors are not aligned, it got actually 18 different images. Um, and then they needed to know, figure out which image was produced by which um, mirror segment. And they've done all of that. So now they can start putting together um, the image. They'll align them all so they all hit the secondary mirror really nicely and, and we'll be able to form an image. So lots of work going on there. And, and so that's what is going to have to happen with all the images that uh, that it gets. Oh no 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 no! This is just a, a single. They chose a very bright star, so they'd be able to find it easy, and they put it on. And once all the mirrors are aligned, so this one star picture becomes a single star picture. Uh, that'll be fine. That'll be good for for everything then. Okay. They just got to align align all those mirrors. So they're calibrating it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We call it alignment, but yes, calibration. Oh. <laughs> um, and we talked a little bit about uh, private space missions. And right after we talked, I think it, it might have even been the next day, a whole bunch of new information came out. Uh, if you remember Inspiration4, this was paid for by billionaire Jarek Isaacman. And it was uh, for cit private citizens, a uh, three day fully automated flight using the SpaceX Crew Dragon. That was in September, 2021. He has now purchased three more flights, calling it the uh, Polaris program. And the first one called Polaris Dawn is scheduled to launch another four people um, with Isaacman on there, no earlier than this November. Again, using uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, and they will go to an even higher orbit. The Inspiration 4 went to an orbit of uh, 565 kilometers, which is above where the space station orbits. The Polaris Dawn might be able to get up to 1300 kilometers. And they're designing new, um, newly designed spacesuits and they might do a spacewalk. So here we have a little, a little guy out there. Uh, because there's no um, hatches, uh, not hatches, um, any way to isolate the astronaut who's going out in space and just depressurize that. Everyone will have to be in their spacesuits. They'll completely depressurize the cabin and then open the hatch and to, to the space, uh, Two of the new EVA suits might go out then. So that's the first section session. The second mission is another Crew Dragon, but the third flight is planned to be on Starship. And this was a big announcement last week. They stacked the whole Starship up. This is again SpaceX's way. Um, so the ship up here, that's the spaceship. That's 50 meters tall. 
This part is the booster to get the spaceship up into orbit at 72 meters tall. And it's quite wide, it's nine meters across. So there'll be lots of room up in there. Uh, certainly this will not happen until uh, this guy alone has, has flown orbits, which should, might happen this year. Um, just depends on how everything goes for him. But, and he's not, you know, everybody's complaining of oh, billionaires going for space rides. Actually, Isaacman is, every, every one of these will be um, uh, fundraisers for certain, certain charities. Uh, the first one in Inspiration4, they raised over 200 million for St. Jude's Research Hospital. So it's to raise awareness um, and funds. And I think more will be going to St. Jude's also. So that's one private mission. Um, the Polaris Dawn there. Um, yep. How, I'm wondering how come they, they don't make it so it has a compartment where it can like uh, private <clears throat> or whatever. Well, it's not all, but it wouldn't be big enough. Oh, okay. Uh, this thing is mainly to go to like the space station or out to Gateway or something like that. It's not really meant for EVAs. They're just experimenting with suits and, and um things. Uh, SpaceX is just building its database, basically. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> and there's another uh, mission called Dear Moon Project, and this is all about lunar tourism uh, and art project. Uh, again, uh, um, conceived and financed by another billionaire, uh, Yusaki Mizawa. It will use the SpaceX spaceship. Here we Kind of see it there. It's not quite the way it's configured, but that's the whole, that's the idea. And it will be a private space flight. He um, a single circumlunar trajectory. There we go. Uh, so once around the moon, he is paying for the whole thing, and it'll include eight civilians, some of whom will be artists, and one or two crew members. So just a single flight, uh, here we go, launched around the earth, flung out in around the moon and then back um, and hopefully land again. Remember the, the whole idea about the starships is that it can land vertically. It doesn't have to be a uh, splash in the ocean and things like that. So hopefully it'll be able to land vertically by itself uh, and plan for no earlier than next year. Uh, but certainly it, it will won't happen before the first uncrewed flight of the SpaceX Starship <clears throat> around the moon. This will be a week long journey that these people get to go on private citizens. It's again, learning more um, about space travel. Hmm. <clears throat> and I've talked a lot about Artemis. Uh, that's the NASA return to the moon. Um, Artemis One will be an uncrewed Orion spaceship on the SLS. So the rocket to get there is the NASA SLS or Space Launch System. And their spacecraft is called Orion. Uh, so the first, it'll just go out and, and come back. The second one is a 10 day crewed Orion spacecraft on the SLS, it will go to the moon and orbit and then come back. The Artemis three is hopefully a crewed Orion and SLS, but then boarding, once they get to the moon, boarding the human landing system, which is the SpaceX space starship um, that will take the crew from Gateway down to the moon and back to Gateway. The problem with all of this is, is of course, none of, nothing has happened yet. This uh, poster was from 2020, September 2020. Um, they were expecting this mission here, which is the uh, commercial lunar payload service, so deliveries to start going to the moon. That hasn't. That was supposed to happen in um, early 21. That didn't happen. The Viper mission is a, a rover that was supposed to be on the moon, checking out landing positions. That hasn't happened. 
Uh, Capstone uh, is using some CubeSats. That might happen next month, hopefully. Artemis One uh, was supposed to happen in 2022. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Artemis Two in 2024. And finally, landing on the moon in 2025. Um, I got to move my thing here. There we go. And this uh, PPE, which is, this is the power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistics outpost. So those are part of the gateway. They were supposed to, to be set up after Artemis one. It's not going to happen until af after Artemis three, um, hopefully before Artemis four. <laughs> What I find amazing is this human landing system that they're proposing. So that big SpaceX uh, Starship um, will be used to convey the crew from that gateway uh, unit down to the moon and then back up to the moon. But it has no way of getting back to Earth. Each crew needs each each manned mission to the moon needs a new one which has to come from earth so they're sending up not only the orion capsule on the sls to get the people there but they also have to send up this starship there to take them around it's some of the logistics seem totally um horrible to me <laughs> um but i'm 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 assuming that they do have some plan the plan in in the workings, but it, a lot of it seems to be they're gonna get to the moon, work on the gateway, go down to the moon to visit, come back up and then just throw the stuff away, just kind of littering the moon with stuff. Um, I'm certainly going to keep track of this more and look into it more. <laughs> it doesn't sound sustainable to me, but then I'm not in, I'm not in charge of anything there. <laughs> <laughs> um, those uh, those cube sats that they're going to be sending, yeah, those be the first satellites that, that orbit the moon. Oh no no no! There's been lots and lots of satellites orbiting the moon. Okay. Uh, up until now, the lunar reconnaissance orbiter, um, India's had a lunar orbiter, China has one. I think Japan has one. There's been lots of stuff there. These ones aren't. Um, yeah, these ones will be going into the new orbit. So up until now, we've just used kind of a circular orbit close to the moon. The The new one is called a um, near, near, no, near rectilinear halo orbit. So it'll be close to the moon at some points, elliptical orbit. Um, to go out further, it's also being a polar orbit. So it'll never be, um, It'll be in continual contract, contact with the Earth. It won't ever be behind the Earth. So it's testing out the, the new orbit and seeing what they can see and what science they can do from there. So <clears throat> life in the universe. Again, this is just the session today is just get trying to get a basic knowledge of what life is, what it needs, so that we can better recognize it maybe on other planets, exoplanets. Well, the problem is that there is no consensus of the definition of life, uh, because so far we only have the one example here on Earth. And, and we can't even agree on the distinction on Earth between living and non-living things. So how are we going to figure out if we find stuff on another planet, if it's life or not. So this does though open up a whole range of, of possibilities from little bacteria like pro microbes to very complex plants and animals. But biologists have identified uh, various traits that are common to all living organisms that we know of, of course, only using the one example here on earth. Um, Non-living things may show some of these traits, but only living things show all of them. So the first one is organization. Uh, living things are highly organized. They contain specialized coordinated parts and all living organisms are made up of one or more cells, which are really the fundamental unit of life. 
Life depends on an enormous number of inter, whoops, too far, interlocking uh, chemical reactions, uh, which make it possible to do work such as moving around or catching prey, um, as well as growing, reproducing and maintaining the structure of their bodies. Um, so living things must use energy and consume nutrients to carry out these chemical reactions. Um, and the total sum of all that, the biochemical reactions uh, is called metabolism. There's also uh, living organisms need to regulate their internal environment to maintain uh, quite a narrow, relatively narrow range of conditions that are needed for the cell to function. Um, so they need to maintain a stable internal environment, even in the face of changing external environments. And this is known as homeostasis. <clears throat> Living organisms undergo regulated growth. So individual cells might become larger in size, uh, multicellular organisms accumulate many cells through cell division and growth depends on pathways that build large complex molecules such as protein and DNA. Uh, living cell organisms need to reproduce. Um, they can do to create new uh, organisms. So reproduction um, can either involve just a single parent, a single cell that just splits into two, or it can require two parents, which is much better for evolution, diversity, and uh, coping with the environment. Living organisms show something called irritability, uh, meaning that they respond to stimuli or changes in their environment. Uh, for instance, plants may turn to look uh, to face the sun. Uh, unicellular organisms might migrate toward a source of uh, nutrients or away from noxious chemicals. Um, and living organisms um, show evolution. So populations of organisms. Uh, undergo evolution, meaning that the genetic makeup of the population may change over time, like speciation. In some cases, evolution involves uh, natural selection, so um, which be then becomes an heritable trait, so it's passed on, such as darker fur color or a narrow beak, which is what uh, Charles Darwin found. Different islands had different um, food sources and the birds there developed specific beaks to, to cope with those sources. So uh, or <clears throat> over generations, this heritable trait uh, provides a fitness advantage. So that's what Charles Dar Darwin was all about, um, the fitness of an organism to continue on and the changes that are needed by that organism to con continue to be to be the fittest. Uh, and uh, so evolution or adaptation. So what are the building blocks of life? Again, life as we know it on earth. So uh, biologists have studied how humans, plants and animals and microbes survive and thrive on earth. And they've identified key ingredients that seem to be essential for life. And the first one is energy. Of course, energy is needed by all organisms to function. It is used in, in just the things we just talked about, metabolism, homeostasis, growth, reproduction, and evolution. Life on earth uses many, many chemicals, but the essential ones are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And we should not be surprised at this because the most abundant elements in the universe are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, helium, a bit, uh, neon, iron, nitrogen, silicon, magnesium, and sulfur. So of the top five um, most abundant ingredients in the universe, life uses, top 10, sorry, of the most abundant ingredients, life uses five of them. So why would you um, 
you know, some people say, oh, well, there are other ingredients that could be used, but why would life choose to use something that's more scarce or rarer when we have all this, these hydrogen, oxygen, et cetera, uh, readily available. <clears throat> and water. Almost all the processes that make up life on earth can be broken down into those chemical reactions. And most of those reactions require a liquid to break down substances so they can move and interact freely. There are a few, so those are kind of the basic things of essentials of life. And there are other things that have, uh, we've seen that have influenced life on earth. And the first one just being time. Uh, the development of complex life took billions of years on earth, but we don't know if this is typical in the universe. Uh, we've mapped it out really clearly on earth when the first life we found and how it was just microbes for the first three and a half billion years and then a sudden uh, increase in the complexity of life but we do like I say we do not know if that is typical of other exoplanets uh, location is probably a very important um, aspect of life uh, earth falls into the goldilocks zone so this means it is just the right distance from the sun that it is not too hot or too cold, it, so it can have liquid water on the surface. And the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone will differ for each type of star. If you have a much hotter star, the habitable zone will be further out away from the star. And the cooler stars like the M dwarfs, the habitable zone will be very, very close in to the stars but liquid water on the surface of a planet is considered really quite necessary for life to at least begin. And then there is that all time scientific favorite of luck. Uh, over time, major catastrophes uh, such as the impact by asteroids and massive volcanic eruptions have wiped out many species. Um, however, this did create opportunities for the survivors to flourish. Um, these accidents along the road means change has a huge, or chance has a huge role in shaping our destinies. If that asteroid had not hit the earth 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs, I mean, there were other things going on at the time, but that seems to be, have been the definitive punch. Uh, we still might not be here. The, astro the uh, dinosaurs might still be ruling the earth. It's only because they were killed off that the little tiny mammals that lived underground um, came out and were able to fill all the niches and that led to um, life. That led to <clears throat> bigger mammals and eventually to us. So I did mention water. Uh, Water seems to be, water and life are, are just intertwined. Everywhere on earth where we see liquid water, we see life. But is water the best fluid for life? Um, what makes it so special? First thing is that water <clears throat> is a polar molecule. So we have our oxygen atom here and two hydrogen atoms. And the way they combine here, that means this side of the uh, molecule has a bit of a positive-ish charge, and this size has a bit of a negative-ish charge. And this means that water molecules are attracted to each other, kind of like tiny little magnets, except it's an electrostatic attraction. Um, and this is, called hydrogen bonding. Uh, these, this leads to quite a strong attractive forces between the molecules um, of water. And this is relied on by the water walkers. You can see they don't have enough weight to push through that. It's almost like a thicker layer of water right at the top. Um, this is also, Uh, used in the capillary forces. If you have any little, um, I'm not sure what you might have in your science lab, 
any little glass tubes of varying diameter, put them in a, a bit of water and see how the meniscus, which is the top of the water here, see how it climbs up. It actually goes, can go above the water uh, around it because the water is, it's a bad analogy, the water is kind of sticking to the sides and letting it grow up. But it's that electrostatic forces again. And this is relied on by trees. Uh, to get the water from their roots right up to the top. They don't have any pumps or anything. They rely on this capillary action. And also um, as the leaves transpire or lose water, it acts as a little bit of a suction. And uh, water is such a good solvent that it's often referred to as the universal solvent. Uh, substances that dissolve in water are things like salts and sugars, acids, alkalines, some gases. These are known as hydrophilic or water loving. And there are also hydrophobic uh, molecules like fats and oils. So hydrophobic uh, water hating. <coughs> On earth, um, we see water in three common phases, solid, liquid, and vapor. But what's really interesting, and I, I only learned this a few years, years ago, there are actually 14 different states that water can be in. So if we look here, uh, this is a graph that shows temperature along the bottom. So we have zero degrees here and pressure along the side. So we have the one bar right here, which is one atmosphere of the pressure at sea level on earth. And then, so the blue is all the types of ices that can be made. I mean, even ices at really high temperatures. Uh, the green shows where the water is liquid and this sort of yellowish oranges area shows where it is a vapor. So if we look here, uh, zero degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, so the surface of the earth, we see that is where water freezes. It can go between solid and liquid here. And of course at 100 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, you have your liquid to vapor uh, exchange. Um, there is one point at zero degrees and at just uh, 40 kilopascals, which is uh, well, 10, 10 one thousandths of a bar. So very, very, very low pressure. Actually water can exist in all three forms. Um, so water can go, doesn't have to go from the ice to the liquid to the vapor, can actually go right from ice to vapor. D this just blew me away. So in some of the, our ice giants, we know there's water somewhere underneath those clouds, but it could be under such high pressure that it's actually an ice, even though it's very, very high temperature also. I just found that amazing. Uh, well, oh, I've lost something here. Nope, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> so where do we find water in this our solar system? That vapor is found in the atmospheres of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Enceladus. We find water as a liquid on the Earth, Europa, Enceladus, Titan and Pluto. Where's Enceladus? I, I don't know if I know. Oh, sorry. Enceladus is a moon around Saturn. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, as is Titan. And water ice we find on Mercury, Earth, the moon, Mars, Europa. That's a moon of Jupiter. Saturn, Enceladus again, Titan again. Uh, Pluto, we know there is water ice. And it's... Uh, uh, moon Charon. We also find water ice in asteroids and comets. How much liquid water do we find in our solar system? So here we have Earth. And Earth looks like a lot of water, but it's very shallow oceans here. So if we put all the water into one ball, that would be the size of all the water on Earth. Europa, which is a small a moon of Jupiter has even more water than Earth does, 
much smaller object, but much more water. And Titan, which is about the same size as our moon, has an you know four or five times more water than Earth. Again, things that I didn't realize. Just looking at Earth, we always consider it a water planet. Yet there are many more objects in our solar system that have way way more water. <clears throat> so, what are the advantages of water? Well, one is that it remains a liquid over a wider and higher temperature range than other liquids. So from zero to 100 degrees Celsius, it can remain in that liquid state. Now this doesn't um, rule out other forms of liquid like methane or ammonia, but because they're at much colder temperatures to be a liquid, uh, metabolism would have really, really slowed down. Um, and it would be especially extremely difficult for uh, life to get started. Maybe once life had started, it might be able to adapt to other liquids, but certainly not to start. There's also the a very strange way that water freezes. Every other liquid, when it freezes, it gets heavier and it drops to the bottom water ice actually floats. It's least dense as ice. This is really important um, for life because, uh, you know, there have been a couple times when our whole earth has been covered in ice. It's called snowball earth. Now, if the water had been freezing and dropping down, and so freezing kind of from the bottom up, um, it would have wiped out all life. But instead it freezes and it floats. So it actually protects the, any life that has, be, um, has evolved in the oceans. And there's also those issues that I talked about. So it can help dissolve many, many things. So just to kind of recap the three basic Things needed for life are those ingredients, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Needs a medium to bring them together and allow mixings. Uh, if you have ingredients on a solid, they just do not mix. Atmospheres, if there's ingredients like there is, you know, in our atmosphere, if there are ingredients for life, there's actually too much motion. They can't get close enough to stick and, and bond and, and create bigger things. So. You almost certainly need a liquid for a medium and uh, energy now, which would be ideally solar, but not it's not restricted to solar. And I'll go over energy sources in our next get together. And I mentioned that um, I had the 3D printer up and running. Well, I've managed to make a few things. <laughs> this is this first one over here, 67P. Don't know if you can see that, there it is. This is actually a comet that the Rosetta mission went to a couple of years ago. And um, Little Filet was uh, the lander and it kind of bounced too much and it bounced and actually landed in a little crevice at, in this kind of neck part of, of the little, uh, actually the big uh, comet. I also did uh, Tycho Crater, which is a crater on the moon. If you look at the moon at full, full moon, you see crater near the bottom, very white, and it's got these big rays going out from ejector rays. So I made that, that also. Uh, unfortunately, the medium I have is too shiny, so it doesn't really show well. And then just the other day, uh, I did, uh, this is a, an asteroid called Psyche. It is made of iron and nickel. So it was once the core of something. And the, I think it's the Lucy mission is going to visit Psyche and uh, see what it's all about. So I think that's all I can talk about for now. So do we have any questions? Yeah, what's the process like uh, learning um, the 3D printer? I think you might be onto something with crater coasters, right? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, you them? can take. Yeah. 
actually what I've what I've wanted to do with these eventually is get, make them out of a different thing. But then if you show uh, Shana shine a flashlight on it and move it across, you can see these shadows as they form. Um, ah. Yeah, it's really kind of interesting. The shadows will you know light up maybe th this side first as the flashlights or this actually the sun. Uh, it comes up and uh, and maybe a little bit of the crater or the mountain in the middle and then the other things will form. Craters are really kind of interesting. <laughs> How's the uh, learning curve been learning how to do the 3D printer? Um, building it was exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, learning how to use it has so far been okay because uh, I'm just using files off the internet. I haven't um, adjusted any files yet, and it the one I, the 3D printer that I got it's it's you plug in the SD card, you say go, and it just prints it. So it's it's been really interesting. I'm gonna have to get into more things, uh, more um, CAD programs, so I can design my own things, but that'll happen. <laughs> well, yeah, you got you got a you got a, um, a meteor that you're gonna have to get 3D printed eventually, right? My my asteroid, yeah, asteroid. yeah, oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, any, any questions, gang? Yeah. Uh, so Titan has like a lot of water on it. Yeah. What is there like? Has the surface of it been shown before, or like? Oh. Like that? Yeah. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft went up um, to Saturn. And it had a little uh, probe called Huygens. We've never really been able to see the surface of Titan because it's covered in a haze, a methane ice haze. And this Huygens dropped down and landed on the surface. And as it was coming through the clouds and got a picture of it, it looks like any part of BC. There are mountains, there are rivers, there are lakes, but it's lakes of liquid methane. So it's minus 179 degrees. So any water, oh, and so it landed it in in a lake that was did not have much um, any methane in it at the moment. And its pictures, you looked out and you could see these boulders, and they were all smooth, meaning that this lake fills and drains, so it's getting erosion. But the boulders were made out of water ice. And on Titan, water ice is on the surface is as tough as any granite on Earth. So the water, the liquid water on Titan is below all this ice on top. Wow. And in, I think in 2030, um, hopefully before then, there's a mission called Dragonfly and it's going to go to, uh, to Titan and it's a little nuclear powered uh, flyer, kind of like a drone. So it's going to be able to hop place to place and maybe get up into these places where there might be some liquid methane lakes. Wow. Did you, did you pull it up? Yeah. Oh, Roman's looking at it already. Awesome. <laughs> I've, a video of the descent. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it does not look like BC. Looks kind of like BC last summer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the forest fires. That's right, yeah. Wow. Hmm. And what about any uh, plans to go to Europa was the other one, right? Europa is the uh, moon around Jupiter. Um, hopefully they'll go there because it's, uh, it's covered in ice and then with this huge, uh, well, 100 kilometers of, of liquid water underneath. It's also spouting. Um, they've flown through the spouts. There are uh, hydrocarbons there. So ingredients for life that are there. Enceladus has the same thing. It's, it has tiger stripes that are spouting. I always get your open and Enceladus. I know where they belong, but I get the tiger stripes wrong all the time. One of them has these lines that are spouting uh, again, uh, liquid water which instantly freezes. Remember, there's no atmosphere there. 
So it can, that uh, at that temperature, that water can go directly from liquid to vapor or ice to vapor. Um, the Europa Clipper is planned, but that'll hopefully be sometimes in the 2030s. Um, the ultimate plan is to send something there that can drill down through the 10 kilometers of ice and maybe send a camera or a little robot submarine or something uh, because you have all the all the ingredients you have liquid water you have um, a, a nutrient source because that liquid water is in contact with um, stuff at solid um, in the core and you so there's an energy there uh, so you might there might be little microbes or little swimmy things around in Europa. There's a there's an old sci-fi. Well, it's not even that old. There was a movie about I don't know eight nine years ago called Europa. And they, yeah. And they go and they core through the ice, and it's getting then it gets scary. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> well, yeah. Be, just being at a, a human being at Europa is scary because it's so close to the really um, high. Um, magnetic field of Jupiter and it would, it, humans might not last long. <laughs> In nature ourselves. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> hmm. cool. uh, when you're talking about like, that's pretty wild to think about water and all those different states, right? Yes. Huh, yeah, that's kind of mind boggling. Yeah. And then yeah, I was uh, there's even different yeah different states of the water and how it behaves within even our own body. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. so, it's like whoa, just the complexity of something that is that it is all around us and we just just take for granted. That's right. right. Yeah, and it does all these weird, crazy, amazing things. But is it is the perfect molecule um, for life? So lots of people say, oh, you know. Personally, I think if we find life anywhere, it's going to be carbon-based and it's going to be in water. You do have these other liquids, but they have so many disadvantages and you do have other elements, but they also have so many dis different advantage or different um, traits making them not as... So like you say, you know, the, the universe is filled with carbon and oxygen and, you know, all this water and stuff. Of course, life is going to choose the easiest way to to happen. Hmm. Cool. Any other comments before we go around the room, guys? All right, we'll just go around as we always do, and people. Okay. Something that was interesting, so takeaway or or whatever. Uh, Anna, do you want to start us off? Nice loud voice, so we can hear you. Yeah. Like learning about the different amounts of water. You didn't catch that. I just, I, I had done a presentation a couple of years ago uh, just about water, um, which was an hour long. So I just kind of cherry picked a few of the interesting. There is lots more to know about water. I thought there would have been more water on Earth. Than there yeah, is. yeah. We we just have a little thin layer on top. <laughs> I mean, there is water underneath, but the total amount. And if you see that total amount, most of that is salt water, or water inaccessible. The amount available to humans is, you wouldn't even see the little ball beside that big ball of water. Agreed. Newman? <laughs> yeah, uh, water is really cool. And <laughs> so many things that you can do with it. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, it technically shouldn't be just the way it does. I remember hearing that people talking about the way water exists on Earth, it does and shouldn't exist. But simply like it coming down from space, it behaves in a way that nothing else does. Hmm. Didn't didn't catch that. Sorry. I I'm not, no I didn't. What, what's water that? Water is 
like behave not like how other liquids well, do or Right, just how water doesn't behave how other liquids do. Yeah, yeah. Well, well and a bit of a connection. A, a few weeks ago, we were out on Gardam Lake doing some uh, lake lake science in the winter, and just learning about you know lake turnover. Yeah. Uh, as it relates to you know it being um, less dense when it's frozen, which is you know, and then uh, lake turnovers, and then the four degrees Celsius is the densest that it's at, right, or the coldest it can be. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, Jared? Uh, I just thought that, like, the thing about Titan was interesting at the end there. I did not know it looked like that or that it had, like, methane lakes or anything like that. Yeah. So I thought that was the, cool that you were saying. There's actually been, um, before Huygens went down, there was a few tantalizing hints uh, Cassini caught Titan just at the right angle and the sun was hitting some of the lakes in the northern hemisphere and we actually got a reflection off the lakes that made it through that that uh, methane haze so we knew there was probably a liquid on there on, on Titan at some point the Artemis missions and um, I, like I, I just heard about them but I'm already bummed that they're not on track. <laughs> <laughs> well NASA is not known for being on track. <laughs> yeah it'll be neat to uh, keep up with that and see what, what goes forward. And, and there's a, another couple private space missions that didn't have much information right now. So I'm going to try and keep track of them all and see, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, who's, going to, who's going to be first up on the moon? Uh, can any of these companies, can, they go, can any of them go up to space without anybody knowing? Could there be like one of these billionaires going up there uh, and you know, just nobody's knowing that there, people are even going up there? Um, it would be pretty, it's pretty hard to hide uh, a, spa a, a rocket. <laughs> yeah. Like There's only the certain places on the earth that you can um, launch from cl the closest to the equator is the best because you get the, an added push from earth's rotation. Uh, so to hide one would be pretty tricky. <laughs> right, right. We definitely need a mountain, a hollowed out mountain, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> internationally, I was a now that Russia's being all warmongering, um, I was a little concerned about the ISS, but I, I read a great article last night about uh, how so interdependent all the Russian modules and the American modules or the NASA module are that even if the order went up there for say the Russians to close the hatch between the two, they, they would not do it. <laughs> because that's just condemning themselves. Um, so the, the Russian part of the ISS controls the altitude um, and um, the, the space station is always kind of getting hit by the atmospheric drag and slowing down and coming down and the Russian module lifts it up. But the American modules actually control the flight pattern, sort of the altitude, attitude of the ISS and there's power sources and things. So I feel much better that the ISS will continue. Uh, huh. No matter what, yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah, actually just this morning they were watching uh, Biden. Uh, oh, yeah. On the news. Uh, uh, Scary stuff. <laughs> uh, Cash? Yeah, um, I, I always thought it was cool that water could take so many shapes, and I definitely didn't know it could take as many as it does. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought the amount of water that was on the different planets was really cool because you think that Earth just looks like a pool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're when we look at exoplanets, we're looking for water worlds. Well, that could be because we haven't been able to find any exomoons yet, well, at one or two. Um, but we should also be looking at maybe big planets farther away from their sun, like Jupiter, who might have planet or moons around it that might have liquid water on it also, looking for life there. 
it just opens up so many more places to look. So if we haven't sent probes there, like we haven't drilled in there, I guess we know that there's water based on, or liquid water underneath, based on, um, I guess, sensors or, or sending waves or, or how do we, how, what's the science for understanding that there's water there? Well, for something like, I think it's Enceladus that has, they're called tiger stripes. Um, and they just happen to be areas in the south part of Enceladus that is spewing water. So that's easy to see. It must have water underneath it. Uh, covered in ice, uh, when the probes go around Jupiter, they also were, and, and Saturn, they were also checking out the moons. And the way the, the moon acts towards the um, gravity of the parent body can tell a little bit something. And they also do x-ray or radar ranging and things like that to get an idea. Um, the resurfacing, like Europa is very smooth on around it. Now you look at our moon and it's just bad. It's got th more than 3 trillion craters. Europa is very smooth. So we know there's a resurfacing going on um, uh. and it would be water, yeah. Uh. Venus also has very few craters. It's got a, a global resurfacing, but that was done by volcanoes. Yeah, how much do you, when we're talking about life and, and there needs to be that energy, um, uh, how important do you think it is that there is some sort of uh, tectonic activity? That's probably a very large part of having life. That, so I say we only know of life on earth. Is the, the big moon, um, because it stabilizes the orbit, is that necessary for life? Is plate tectonics necessary? It certainly gives a better chance as far as we can tell, but is it absolutely necessary? Lots of different things that Earth has going on for it. Um, but again, we've only got the one example. We can't tell what's, what's necessary or not. Right. Huh. No, that's uh, that's interesting, and yeah, for me, yeah, just learning about. I, I always like seeing the pictures of where the spaceship goes when it leaves Earth, yeah. you know, and seeing that those missions that are going around, you know, that are potentially going to have people going around the going around the moon, yeah, and kind of coming back and landing. I don't know, just kind of kind of puts it into perspective that like, whoa, you're going to be gone out there for how long? You're going around the moon, and you're going to come back, and you're going to land back on earth yeah yeah that's that's pretty amazing that that kind of technology and mathematics has been developed and, and the guy that's doing it um and he says he wants to take a couple artists is that just to have a different idea or just a different way of capturing some of what's up yeah. there? i know that uh chris hadfield did something similar going up not to space but he went to the um i think he went to the antarctica or up to or or something and then it, it went with him and some scientists and a bunch of artists and oh, they, oh yeah they went on like a on a on an ice boat down there and did something like hmm. that but, i don't think i've heard of that that's in, yeah this fellow uh he's into big into culture and art and science so he's just combining them all hmm. oh, cool different lens i guess eh? yeah yeah any other comments or questions gang I think we're good. Well, thank you very much. Awesome. Colleen. Thank you again. And see you in a couple of weeks. Yay. Uh, and I'll go into more about life. Um, I'll update on things that I can. And I'll go into a uh, little bit more on life, what's needed for life, etc. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much. That was excellent. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Bye.